Hello everyone. Today I am going to highlight few things that you need to know and to check before starting your eye muscle surgery. I will start with the visualization. Eye muscle surgery can be done using the naked eye or using a surgical loop or operating microscope. Performing eye muscle surgery using your naked eye does not provide any magnification and in general is not recommended. Even if you believe that you see all the necessary details, you might end up in some unexpected surprises. The surgical loop is probably the ideal method for visualization during eye muscle surgery and is the preferred method for visualization by most pediatric ophthalmologists. The surgical loop has several advantages. It provides the necessary magnification while allowing flexibility of movement. For example, you can move around the patient to take the sutures in a more convenient way without having to adjust everything like what would happen with the operating microscope. It also does not obscure the view of the assistant to allow him or her to see the surgical field easily. In addition, Many loops now can be fitted with an illumination system. I prefer to use a loop with a low magnification but with a relatively long working distance of at least 40 cm or even 50 cm to allow you to see clearly without having to come very close to the surgical field. Another alternative for visualization is the use of the operating microscope. The operating microscope offers a higher magnification and provides adequate illumination. However, there is less flexibility of movement with the microscope, and you can easily feel that when you have to change your position to take the sutures from another position or when you need to switch to another muscle or to the other eye. In addition, some surgical microscopes are a bit bulky and obscure the view of the surgical field of your assistant. However, it is recommended to use the operating microscope in reoperations or when looking for a slipped or lost muscle because the microscope would provide more details. The second aspect that you need to consider is the type of anesthesia. Eye muscle surgery is usually done under general anesthesia, but it can also be done using local anesthesia or under topical anesthesia with some sedation. General anesthesia is the most commonly used type of anesthesia, particularly because of the young age of the patient. It is also the preferred mode of anesthesia if you want to do a post-operative adjustment after surgery because it allows a relatively quick recovery of the muscle tone. Another type of anesthesia is the local anesthesia, which is particularly helpful if you are doing a monoocular surgery in an adult. Local anesthesia also helps to reduce the pain after surgery. Remember that you can always augment the local anesthesia during surgery by injecting more anesthesia into the posterior subtenous space as the conjunctiva is already opened. However, local anesthesia requires a proper anesthesia technique. In addition, post-operative adjustment of sutures will have to be delayed for at least six hours to allow full recovery of the muscle tone. While eye muscle surgery can sometimes be done under topical anesthesia, this usually requires sedation and a cooperative patient with a good anesthesia team. Topical anesthetics should be placed deep in the fornix for about two minutes. It requires an experienced surgeon to allow manipulations without traction on the muscles. You need also to put your surgical plan where you can see it to avoid doing the wrong patient 
the wrong eye or the wrong muscle. Finally, you need to choose the appropriate suture material and the appropriate needle. Eye muscle surgery is usually done using polyglycolic acid sutures. The most known trait name of which is vicryl from acetone. Polyglycolic acid is an absorbable suture. It gets completely absorbed in two muscles, but it loses its tensile strength in three to four weeks. The muscle is expected to heal to the sclera during this time. It is a braided suture, meaning that it consists of several filaments twisted together to add to its tensile strength and to decrease the tissue damage. The braiding also makes it easier to handle and less stiff than monofilamentous sutures. This can be further improved by soaking the suture in saline solution after opening the package and before using it. However, being braided and multifilamentous, it allows utterance of bacteria and may cause some tissue dragging during suturing. For this reason, it is usually coated. The coating decreases the tissue dragging and bacterial utterance and also facilitates its identification during surgery. Needles used for scleral sutures should be spatulated. A spatulated needle has a soft band and a flat undersurface, making it unlikely to penetrate the deeper tissues. On the contrary, for skin sutures, a cutting or reverse cutting needle is usually needed because it glides through the tissues easily without undue pressure, resistance, or trauma. However, cutting and reverse cutting needles should not be used for scleral sutures. The curve of the needle must be chosen depending on the tissues that are being sutured. If suturing deep tissues, a more curved needle is often needed, for example, half a circle. On the other hand, for scleral sutures, a less curved needle, such as three edges of a circle, is often used. The most commonly used needle is the S24 needle from Acelon. However, other needles might also be used, such as the S14, S29, or the S28. Thank you.